What's up guys, it's Mitch from the DIYrecordingstudio.com and today I'm gonna to be showing you a preamp build. Basically, over the last six months, I've been building a heap of new gear for the studio. I've been trying to upgrade it in a big way to get more into a hybridized studio situation, which means analog preamps and a patch bay. And I've actually got all that gear behind me now. And I've actually been building a few different types of preamps. So I've got those build videos coming real soon. The first of which today is part one of the Sound Sculptor MP573, and it is a faithful recreation of the famous Neve 1073. It's modeled heavily after that. Circle wise, it's very accurate to the original uh, vintage version of the 1073 that everyone knows and loves, and that's found in some of the biggest recording studios worldwide. And I'm hoping that these new preamps bring something different to my recording process, something new creatively, uh, a lot more sonic choices, but also some really technical things like more headroom and dynamic range in my recordings and all these kind of things. And I'm gonna do a whole heap of videos comparing the different preamps, and doing shootouts with different mics on those preamps and instruments being recorded on those preamps. Uh, but for today, this is just part one of the actual build process because this was a DIY kit that I got from Sound Sculptor. Sound Sculptor are an amazing company located in France. Uh, they do a whole heap of different preamp designs and EQs and compressors for the 500 series racks that are found in a lot of studios. And the first preamp I chose to buy and build as a DIY kit was the MP573 because I think as far as recording goes, you can't go past that Neve sound. It was definitely something that I've coveted and thought about for a long time and i'm super excited to share that build process with you guys so stick with me this is part one of the build there's a lot to it so i'm going to break them up into parts and then in the coming weeks i'm actually going to do some shootouts and all that and if you're interested in building any of your own diy preamps or any other gear make sure you hit me up in the comment section down below but let's get into this build all right and this is me before i just got to the beginning of the build and I've unboxed it and start taking out all the parts so the first thing that I did was sort through all the components and check everything was there and then I located the PCBs and started splitting them um, because they they come packaged all joined together um, and then you just break the different parts of the PCBs off um, because you'll work on them independently from each other and uh, you can see then I had to file them down uh, because some of the PCBs, as you snap them, have some rough edges. So it's good to file these down uh, so they fit nicely within the chassis. Um, yeah, so that was a pretty easy thing. Then I started sorting all of my resistors out in value order so they were easy to find. And you can see in this uh, part of the video that I'd already written on the little tabs their values. I'd gone through with a multimeter and checked all those values. Um, and then I sorted them all out individually so I could find which one was which. And then on the assembly guide, uh, I started putting the components on the B side. So the back side of the board, there's some uh, components you have to do first. So I started on those and you can see me here uh, forming some diodes with the component forming tool, just bending those. So then just insert nice and neat into the component board. Um, those bending tools are like, pretty easy to use and um, you can get them for pretty cheap and they're definitely worth uh, getting. I've done work before on PCBs without one and uh, this is definitely a better way to work. It makes the workflow quite quick. Um, so once I inserted all those diodes and resistors, I flipped the board over and started soldering. And you can see like that I start working from the outside of the component leads and I'll get to whatever's easiest first. Um, and then if there's some components I can't get to, I'll snip the outside ones that I've already soldered. And if there's any left that I couldn't get to, I'll then go in and solder those. Um, and that's the easiest way to work. You might not be able to get a nice clean access with your iron to some of the components on the inside. So just solder the ones you can, snip them, and then do the next ones and just take your time. Um, yeah, and so you can see as I flip the board here, then I'm putting some relays on the back there. And with relays and capacitors, they can be a bit tricky to place. 
So what I did here was I was bending a leg, one of the legs to kind of hold the capacity, the relays in place and then soldering it and then checking the orientation and then soldering the remainder legs. But I didn't like the idea of bending the legs just in case one of them broke because they were quite tough to bend. So later on, what I end up doing um, with all the capacitors and relays is actually just taping them to the board with some electrical tape and then holding them in place with electrical tape instead which is a bit safer um, you don't have to risk uh, accidentally snapping one of the component legs um, yeah so that worked out better for that part and you can see as I flip the board um, I've got all those back components in so that was a nice and easy part of the job and then I have to put this little LED light in next uh, that was a bit fiddly uh, you can see I tried to prop it up with some tape because it has to be raised a little bit from the board um, but that wasn't too hard to do and then I had to flip back to the A side and this is where most of the components are going and we start with the rectifier diodes first um, you can start with any of the diodes but I started with the rectifier diodes and then I put in the other smaller diode components and the tricky part with diodes is that you need to check how uh, you orientate these because they are polarized so there's a positive and negative side and they have to be placed the right way um, otherwise they won't work so I always made sure that I had the orientation right and then flipped the board and then soldered them and once the diodes are done then it's onto the resistors and the resistors um, are one of the bigger jobs to do on the board because there are a lot of them um, which is pretty typical of most PCB work um, so you're gonna have a lot of different resistors to do and that's why I sorted them out earlier I uh, sorted them out by value and then I could check them um, on their placement on where they were supposed to be um, in the corresponding paperwork uh, in the instruction manual or you can even use the PDF on your laptop and search for where the components are that way which is what I actually ended up doing um, and then that way I could get them all placed nice and easily and then flip the board and started soldering and once again as I started soldering um, these resistors in uh, I would start with the outside components, uh, snip them, and then move my way, work my way inside. Um, it's just the easiest way to work, especially when you've got that many component legs hanging out of the PCB. Just solder what you can get to nice and comfortably, snip them, and then get to the next ones. Um, and yeah, you can see this would have taken quite a while. Um, and you can see as I get the final part snipped, um, you know, all my joints are relatively neat. Um, it's not any flux all over the board and there's nothing crazy going on on the component side either. And in the next part, I actually forgot to film this, um, but at the top of the board there, you can see I've taken a snapshot and it's a um, IC chip that you have to solder next. Um, it's a tricky component because it has a correct orientation as well. You need to look at the little dot and I'll zoom in and you can see that. And basically that dot has to um, correspond with the little um, semicircle cutout on the PCB. It tells you which way to orientate that circuit. And then when you put these integrated circuits, you have to be careful when you're putting them on the board of two things. The first is that um, you don't have any static electricity, um, but there's a good um, warning for that in a lot of the instructions. And then um, after that, you also need to be careful when trying to get the legs to line up in the board um, because they bend out quite a bit. So you have to kind of straighten them all to line them up with the board. And these legs can be quite easily um, broken if they're bent too much they can um, if you bend them backwards and forwards too much they're likely to snap so you don't want that to happen so you got to be careful with that when trying to get them in the board just don't force them take your time with it and get them to slide into the board nice and neat and then solder them in and just be careful that you um, you know aren't shuffling your feet on some carpet or something and building up some uh, static electricity and then next up I inserted the test pins um, and then I taped them down so that they would stay in the board um, they will tend to fall out when you try to solder them from the back side of the board so I used uh, just some electrical tape to hold them in place as I soldered them um, and then I went through and 
snipped each of the um, legs off because they stick through the board. They're quite sharp and you don't want them on the board sticking out. Um, yeah. And then the next uh, component to put in was the jumper header. So this jumper header is so you can um, bypass some of the circuitry later on when testing. And I held that in place with some tape and then soldered it in place, as you can see there. After the header, um, I had to put in the smaller ceramic capacitors. Um, they come with some, um, they're usually stuck to some cardboard and stuff and they can be a little bit tricky to take apart. But then once you get that, they're quite easy to insert into the board. Um, and then once they're inserted into the board, you can see that the best way to hold them in place is just bend those legs out a little bit. Um, so when you flip the board to solder them, they're much easier to hold in place um, so that they don't sort of extend too far out of the board as you solder them. So as you can see here, they might wobble around a bit, but they're not really going to go anywhere because those legs are bent and holding them in place so they don't come up too far from the board there. Next up was the vertical resistors. And you can see as I zoom in here that the vertical resistors in the middle of the board there, um, you need to bend the legs uh, 180 degrees and the easiest way to do this is to get something like a small allen key or some kind of skewer or something to bend the legs over and then that'll make them bend easy um, on a 180 degree without risking breaking the leg at the point where it sort of goes into the resistor itself um, it'll give you a nice clean bend basically and then as you insert them into the board there um, the longer leg that's left um, goes into where there's like a little bit of a circle like you can see there on the um, R12 that I'm about to insert um, and where there's R12, R13, R14 um, there's this little circle highlighted and that's the part where you um, insert the resistor end and then the longer the little leg that's bent then goes into the other side um, and you got to make sure that orientation is there. It just helps the components fit in the board correctly. You can see as I insert that there, um, the component goes in that way. And then once um, those are all in place, obviously you can go along and then solder in all those components. And the same rule as always applies. Basically, the best way to do everything, um, especially because those um, vertical resistors are so close is to work around from the outside as always and then snip some of the legs away and then get to the next ones and just take your time with it and make sure you don't accidentally bridge any of the connectors um, you don't want any solder jumping from one of the connectors to the other um, you want nice clean solder joints and then once the resistors are done, the next step is to start with all of the film capacitors, which are these red capacitors that I'm inserting on the board. Um, there's a fair few of those as well. Um, the easiest way to deal with those, uh, I used to bend the legs to hold them in place, but I don't like doing that. As I mentioned earlier in the video, um, what I prefer to do now is use uh, electrical tape to hold them in place and then I'll solder one of the legs and then I'll take the tape off and then check that the orientation is okay and then I'll solder the other leg and then snip them. And then next up were these uh, tantalum capacitors. They're these yellow capacitors that look a little bit like the ceramic, um, little yellow ceramic capacitors that you'd already seen me do but these ones are polarized like electrolytic capacitors which means they have a positive and a negative side and you need to make sure the positive side is orientated correctly so the long leg uh, will go through that positive hole where there's a little plus sign and um, then you bend the legs like normal and then flip the board and then solder those in place as well then the next components to go in are a set of transistors. Now these aren't polarized, but they've got three legs on them and they have a correct orientation uh, on the board. You can see that there's kind of like a bit of a semicircle shape and the transistors themselves have that kind of shape. And basically you have to orientate the transistor so that it is in that same shape as it shows on the board. So it's pretty simple to follow. Um, you do need to gently bend the legs out and then the other tricky thing with transistors is you don't want to overheat them with the iron so 
the best thing to do if you've got five of them to solder in like this um in this point in the board um you can solder a leg on each and then let them cool down for a bit and then go on to the next transistor solder one of those legs and then move around and then go back around through them that way so you don't overheat the components because it can get quite hot when you solder each three of the legs and if you're a bit slower with the soldering iron um, you might overheat them and after those uh, transistors are done the last component is a thermosistor um, I'm not sure exactly what a thermosistor does exactly. I assume it's got something to do with stopping the board from blowing up or something. Um, I'm not too sure, but um, it's just one component and um, it's pretty simple. Same as uh, the capacitors, the ceramic capacitors, you just put it in, bend the legs, solder it in place. And then once that's done, that's all the resistors and those sort of trickier little components done. Um, but it's on to a DI connector. So the DI connector here, um, I didn't realize it actually had one of the components already connected to it. And I could have just pulled that out that had to connect to the DI board that you build later on. I accidentally left it here, but you actually can remove that. So that little um, part that's sticking out um, should just be the... Um, connector that the pins slot into so you can actually pull that apart it felt really difficult to pull it apart so I was a bit sort of scared of pulling it apart and maybe breaking one of the legs or the pins so I just left it there and then when I built the DI later you'll see that it actually comes out and I fixed it then and worried about it then um, but for the build um, it'll be there and um, you can just have a chuckle about the fact that I was a bit scared to take that part out <laughs> and um, you can see I did basically with these connectors, um, the same as I always do, uh, put a bit of tape on it, hold it in place, solder one leg, check the orientation, and then solder the rest of the pins. Um, yeah. And after that, uh, you can see in the center of the screen is the output transformer connector or TX connector in the uh, manual. And basically uh, later on, you'll see that there's uh, the transformer wires will uh, be soldered to another board and a header that will go and slot into this connector. And you solder this the same way again. Just put some tape on it, um, solder the pin, uh, one of the pins on the legs, and then check it for orientation. Make sure it's on the board correctly, and then solder the rest of the legs. And then the next component to go in is the link connector and what it is for is to connect an EQ module to the um, input stage of the preamp which completes the correct 1073 architecture and basically I just did the same as previously I um, taped the component in soldered it and then undid the tape checked the orientation and then moved to the next part and then similarly to that I had to do the potentiometer next, um, same process um, as you can see in the video. Um, the potentiometer comes important when you get to uh, the final stages of checking the device once it's all finished and built. Um, you will slightly adjust this potentiometer to get the right voltage at, I think it's at the input transformer, but don't quote me on that. Um, but yeah, it's part of the final setup stage. And then for the last part of this video we're going to look at today for these smaller components is the electrolytic capacitors and they are similar to some of the other components like diodes in that they're polarized so they have a positive and a negative uh, side and the longer leg of the electrolytic capacitors has to line up with the plus sign and there's like a little white strip on the electrolytic capacitors and that has to line up with the negative side um, on the PCB. So it's pretty clearly labeled, which is the positive and negative side on the PCB. Um, and you just got to make sure that that orientation is correct so that you don't have any issues later on. But these are pretty easy to install. Um, you just put them in like the resistors and then bend the legs a little bit so they don't slip out of the board when you're soldering them and then solder them and snip them and then they're done. And that's the last part of part one of the 1073 uh, style preamp build. So it's the Sound Sculptor MP573. Um, yeah, and we'll go on to more in the next video. So thanks for sticking around for part one of this DIY build of the Sound Sculptor MP573. If you've got any questions about the build so far, hit me up in those comment sections down below. And don't forget to hit like and subscribe. I'm Mitch from the DIYRecordingStudio.com.
I'll catch you soon. Mm-hmm.